What's up everybody, Craig Lieberman coming back at you with another video. This one is uh, answering a question I get a lot. As we near the end of the Fast franchise as we know it, I still find it hard to believe that the guy who started it all, director Rob Cohen, hasn't been back to direct another Fast and Furious movie. What's going on? We're gonna find out right after this break. I don't know if you know this, but I actually now have a merch store. And if you haven't checked out the video description below my videos, then you're missing out. Currently, I've got a pack full of movie quote t-shirts and more styles are being added every month and new items are in development right now. So have a look, see if there's anything you like and wear it with pride. The link is in the video description below. The first movie in the series was spurred by a 1998 magazine article. Most of you have probably heard this story. What, what happened was a fellow by the name of Ken Lee, then a reporter for the New York Daily News, wrote about the underground world of street racing in Queens, New York, which was going on feverishly back then. He later pitched a more in-depth story about the underground culture to Vibe magazine, and that's what got this whole thing started. The article was then picked up, and the article focused on a young racer named Rafael Estevez, a then 30-year-old drag racer, noting that he and his cronies wouldn't be caught dead driving uh, the gaudy, muscular beast of yesteryear. He was, of course, referring to muscle cars, the traditional muscle cars of that time. And as the article noted, the new generation of street racers were tricking out cheap, back then, Japanese cars like Honda Civics and Acura Integras and slapping on a bunch of stickers on their car to brag about the parts they had installed in the car or the parts they wish they had installed. We still do that today, right? Rob Cohen, though, having read the article, was inspired and pitched the idea of a Universal Pictures. Producers like Neil Moritz and Doug Claiborne embraced it and thought it would make for a good plot for a movie. Collectively, these are the guys that created the masterpiece with their vision that has now endured for 20 years. So they, of course, optioned the article and the wheels were set in motion from that point. The project was initially titled Redline. I'm sure most of you have heard that story too. Prior to this project, many people never heard of Rob Cohen, but in fact, he had already established himself with a long history working in film and television going back decades. In fact, his first break came back in the early 1970s when he discovered a script in a random pile of neglected screenplays. He found one and he recognized its quality and commerciality and uniqueness, so Cohen knew that the script had the potential to make for an award-winning major motion picture. And he was pestering his boss about it all the time. This is gonna be great, this is gonna be great. He championed the piece relentlessly, even with his own job at stake. And his boss finally said, Rob, I'll try to sell the script, but if it doesn't sell, I'm gonna fire you. <laughs> True story. Right after he said that, Universal bought it that same afternoon and paid a record price for it. The movie was called The Sting and it went on to win an Academy Award in 1973. Clearly Rob had a uh, talent for picking winners. Maybe you've never seen that movie though, but your parents would surely know it. And you have to consider that Rob was only 33 years old at the time. He was off to a good start. Rob then went on to establish himself as a talented screenwriter, a producer, and a director. Later in 1973, he landed a spot as head of current programming at 20th Century Fox. That was the same year that the long-running TV series called MASH got started. Again, you may not know that series, but your parents certainly do. And then in 1987, Cohen got a producer credit for the Arnold Schwarzenegger hit, a movie called The Running Man. If you haven't seen it, you'd like it. Check it out. And starting around 1999, Rob was directing full-time. He had some successes with films like Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, which was pretty good. Dragonheart, kind of like Daylight I haven't seen, and another movie called The Rat Pack, which was actually pretty accurate and pretty cool. And in 2000, at age 52, Rob was chosen to direct a little movie, the first movie of what was to become a 20 plus year franchise and has been has raked in nearly $7 billion so far. What movie is that? Fast and Furious. Rob's enthusiasm for this project was off the charts. He was all in, he did extensive research. He immersed himself in the street racing culture. He was going to tuner car shows himself. He even went to a street racer or two and he took it all in just as a bystander to understand what was going on. He wanted to understand every aspect of this world and he wanted audiences to see, feel, and experience what the racers and the spectators feel. And that drove him to create this movie the way he did it. As a complete outsider myself, I was fortunate enough to happen to be there to watch Rob work on set. He was polite, kind, and completely consumed emotionally in the project. 
His energy on set was absolutely contagious. I do not remember a bad filming day, and I have never heard him raise his voice. So it was a great experience for me. Some of this comes through if you watch the behind the scenes feature of the DVD, go back and check it. There's a couple scenes where they show uh, Rob Cohen there, especially at the first street race. You can see his energy there. And again, at Race Wars. And Rob, of course, appeared in the first film as the pizza boy. And if he was standing there during that scene, you'd know how much fun he was having. He was really having a great time. I'll take care of the pizza boy. <laughs> <laughs> I also had the opportunity to hear Rob's thoughts about the casting of the film. Rob was very excited about Paul Walker at the time, before the movie got started, and he speculated that Paul Walker had everything he needed to become the next Steve McQueen. Interesting comparison, I thought, because I knew quite a bit of Steve, about Steve McQueen. Rob's brilliance, though, in choosing relatively unknown actors like they did in For Star Wars uh, really helped create an air of authenticity to the movie. I just don't think they could have done it with big name actors. I don't think it would come off the same way. You know, some, having somebody like Brad Pitt or other top actors were not only out of the question because of the film's small budget, relatively speaking, but I just don't think it would have worked. During the post-production process, Rob and the team toiled over every second of edited film, especially when they were making their music choices. In fact, in a rough cut that I saw of the film in March of 2001, one scene was dubbed to Crazy Town's track, Butterfly. Rob really wanted that track in the movie, but it was rumored that the band was asking something like $300,000 for the usage rights, and so he had to find something else. And ironically, today I cannot imagine that movie using any music than what was actually selected for the final production. Frankly, I think it's aged well and I can't imagine it any other way. Rob's enthusiasm and amazingly talented production crew turned a $39 million movie into a $211 million box office success and laid the groundwork for the next chapter. However, fate took a strange turn. Rob hitched his wagon to Vin Diesel, who seemed to have the makings of a superstar, Arnold Schwarzenegger style, and he went off to create Triple X with Vin Diesel. Now, if you think about it, it was, at least on the surface, a wise choice. If we're being honest, Paul Walker was many things, but he just wasn't quite Steve McQueen. Of course, this was early in his career. But Vin Diesel, with the big muscles and all that kind of stuff, could become a next Arnold Schwarzenegger. In fact, Walker's subsequent films outside of the Fast franchise were not even close to blockbusters. Paul Walker movies like Eight Below, Pleasantville, She's All That, Running Scared, and Joyride, just they were hard pressed to hit even 15 million dollars in domestic box office sales. In fact, many of Walker's films struggled to break even the 25 million dollar mark. Not a good sign for a young aspiring actor. And of course, we all love the guy, but bad scripts or Paul's one dimensional acting just didn't translate to big box office success. And while Triple X did okay, came in at about 141 million, it was still $70 million short of the first Fast and Furious movie's box office date. The 2005 sequel called State of the Union only mustered $71 million, mostly because Vin Diesel went off to work on another project. But when Vin did come back to the, that Triple X franchise in 2017 with Triple X Return of the Xander Cage, the movie finally made $345 million. So Vin's other movie franchise at that time was built off the Riddick character, and it consisted of three movies. And collectively, they did not make as much as the 2017 movie Return of Xander Cage. My point is this, that outside of the Fast and Furious movies, while Vin did go on, on to some success in a few other movies. Guardians of the Galaxy comes to mind where he played Groot. Paul Walker struggled to rack up big box office numbers. And so things were going in different directions. My point is that if I were Rob Cohen in 2002, I would have hitched my wagon to Vin Diesel too. And it's nothing against Paul, it's just Vin seemed to have a better potential. But other than Triple X, Rob did not direct any of Vin's later movies. So was it a good choice for him? You'd have to ask him. Rob's next big movie was a movie called Stealth, which was released in 2005. Now I had high hopes for this movie. The technical errors again had me distracted. <laughs> perhaps because I know too much about uh, well, things like dive bombing in an aircraft when you have guided munitions. One press of a button and a GPS guided JDAM would go right through, and through a ventilation staff. Didn't anybody watch Desert Storm footage 12 years early? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm probably not the audience for that one. I'm strapping a rocket into a paveway, okay. I bet Rob's technical advisor on that film was frustrated too. Again, I'm probably not the target audience. Jamie Foxx, the dude from Booty Call, remember that movie? Played basically the same role as he did in Booty Call, but now in a war movie. Sam Shepard always leaves me flat. It's just not, I just, it's nothing cool. Joss Lucas is like an Aaron Paul that you ordered from Wish, 
and Jessica Biel was strictly there for eye candy. And unfortunately, the, the movie did not fare well, taking in a disappointing $76 million worldwide, not just domestic, worldwide. Fortunately, Rob finally got a good script when he got The Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which went on to make uh, $400 million worldwide gross. Pretty good. Just sometimes you don't know when it's gonna be a hit. He also did a low budget erotic thriller with Jennifer Lopez in 2015 made, that made over $50 million and on a $4 million budget. So Rob's credits include producing more than 150 commercials for products like Star Wars merchandise, Ford, GM, Mercedes, Chevrolet, Saab, but even Burger King. So he's not just directing. His producer credits include nearly 20 major motion pictures and at least a dozen TV shows with multiple episodes. So with such an impressive resume, why has he not come back to the Fast franchise? I had to look this up. I, I just didn't understand it. So if you go back to Too Fast, Too Furious, Vin did not like the script. So Vin went off to do Triple X and Rob went with him. I mentioned that a moment ago. And then in the timeline, Vin Diesel and Rob Cohen had signed on to a sequel for Triple X even before the first film had opened, but both dropped out as Diesel disliked the script. While, and then that's when Cohen went off to work on Stealth, which was released in 2005, around the same time that Universal was trying to reboot the franchise, making a movie called Tokyo Drift. So these choices, timing and circumstances, seemed to put Rob on a different trajectory. It became clear that Universal was wanted to continue the Fast and Furious series despite the lackluster results of Too Fast and Furious, but this time they brought in a car guy, Justin Lin, and he got the call. My question is, was Rob even approached for that film? Or did Universal just assume that he was busy with the production of Stealth? Or did Rob tell him that he was already busy with the Stealth movie that I mentioned earlier? Don't know. There's nothing printed anywhere online that I could find. So regardless, Tokyo Drift was Justin Lin's first time at the helm of a Fast movie and three movies into the franchise now. The first, first one, second, Too Too Fast, Too Furious, and Tokyo Drift, we won a third director. Lin would end up directing the next three films also until James Wan jumped in for Fast 7. Lin at the time had decided to take a break for Fast 7 saying that he had franchise exhaustion. Uh, it was a rough time for everybody. Even Justin Lin was getting tired of the same old thing from the franchise by that time. He looked through four, five, and six. It was the same thing over and over again. Fast forward to today, we are now nine movies in and only one director has worked on more than one Fast and Furious movie, and that of course is Justin Lin. So you can't blame Universal for sticking with the winning recipe. Under Justin Lin, the franchise has exploded, no pun intended. And up until Fast 9, each movie in the series made more money than the last installment. Not including Tokyo Drift, of course. So I'm not going to pretend that I understand the politics of who gets chosen to direct what films, except to say that leadership changes at the top level of a motion picture studio occur often, very often as it turns out. And with each regime change, the direction changes, and along with those changes, heads of studios usually install their trusted management team to execute their new agenda. That's just the way it works, and it pretty much in any organization, if you think about it. So I have no idea whether any of this had to do with Rob Cohen being passed over um, to direct or maybe I'm, uh, Rob had made the conscious choice to pursue the other projects. I haven't seen anything to the contrary, so who knows. Perhaps he thought that there shouldn't be a sequel to the first movie, which I heard a rumor about, or he perhaps he saw Too Fast, Too Furious and decided that the series had already run out of gas. It's tough to say. I do know that Rob himself said in an interview not that long ago that he would like to come back right now, even if it was only to co-direct. Now that would be cool. But I can't imagine why Justin Lin would want to share the spotlight. But if I were Justin, I'd have to think that I'd be honored to have Rob be part of the final installments, especially considering that Rob's vision contributed in a big way to the enduring success of the franchise that it has enjoyed for the last 20 years. So, don't know. Frankly, even if Rob did come back, I have to wonder what he would do insofar as the storyline or how much influence he would have. I mean, would Rob campaign for more street racing? Would he change Paul Walker's fate in the movie? Would he change Dominic Toretto's fate in the movie? Would he campaign for radical changes in the direction? What? what which way they're going to go? Are they going to move it into the next generation? Who knows? It's hard to say and I wouldn't want to speculate. Regardless, having Rob participate with these last couple installments would be a fitting tribute to Rob's contributions to the franchise and I, th I have to think that he would bring some meaningful ideas and influence. But at this point, this franchise is an unstoppable freight train and the current production team and picture car team are producing movies that are highly successful and they're making hundreds of millions with each new release, so they're killing it. So what do you think? Should Rob Cohen come back for the last installments of the franchise? Are these the last installments? <laughs> Let me know in the comments below.
And of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for my content. Last but not least, please take a moment to check out my merchandise store. You can see some of the shirts just below this video. Follow the link in the description to see the rest of my merch. In fact, I added some new designs this, this past week. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.